I hope you are familiar with this beautiful building at 333 Park Street. It's right behind the Civic. Its architectural style is called Venetian Gothic. It was built in 1878, 1879. It's one of two buildings in Kalamazoo uh, in continuous use by the organization from its inception. The Baptist Church is the other. The Ladies Library Association building is the first building in Kalamazoo to be placed on the National Historic Register that was in the 70s. In 1844, two women began meeting regularly to read aloud to each other. They brought their sewing because they had to be productive. They began sharing books. The group grew. The book collection grew. By 1852, there were eight charter members who decided to form an association, the Ladies' Library Association. Its mission was to bring literacy and culture to the people of Kalamazoo. It was the first circulating library in the town. You could join the subscription library for 50 cents or the donation of a book. And if your book was late, you were charged a penny a day, and that's how they began earning some money to add more books to their collection. Each vintage chair pictured here is a velvet folding chair. They're quite tiny because those ladies were smaller than we are today, but we've saved eight of them. They're older than the building, I believe. So uh, the building was built in 1878, but they carried these chairs around since 1852, wherever they were renting a room or given space to hold their meetings. Uh, each vintage chair here has a little gold plate with the name of each of those eight charter members. Most important among them was Lucinda Hinsdale Stone, the wife of the new Baptist minister and the first president of Kalamazoo College. She taught the women's department for no pay, I might add, often with a child or a yellow lab at her feet. The Stones believed in co-education, abolition, equality of the sexes. Lucinda Stone became known as the mother of clubs. Not only did she uh, help get this Kalamazoo club on its feet, but she helped more than a dozen other women's clubs in the area and across the state get started. Um, after the Kalamazoo Public Library was funded by public monies in 1872, their library collection uh, was less and less used. So they had to kind of reinvent themselves. It was Lucinda Stone who really helped to turn the Ladies' Library Association into a college for women. She taught Greek history and art history in 12-week courses. Uh, the money that was charged would go half to her and half to the Ladies' Library Association. Other women there taught French and drawing classes. The plaque on our building states that this building was the first in the nation to be built exclusively for a woman's group. The LLA was the first women's club in the state of Michigan. It was the third in the nation. <coughs> Another charter member and woman of vision was Ruth Webster. She was the longtime treasurer and librarian for the association. She is the one who established a building fund and encouraged the group to consider having a building of their own. She offered property to the organization three different times they finally accepted. So she donated, donated the land where the uh, building stands today. She saw that that building fund grew often 
by making loans to the husbands of the members at interest, of course. <clears throat> one whole, uh, one huge obstacle to this whole endeavor of having property, having a building of your own, was that women in these days could not own property. The only way they could own property was through dower rights. This was something that had never been done before. A woman's organization um, own property, build their own building. So there had to be a legislative action passed to allow these ladies to own the land and the building. I imagine that one member's husband knew somebody who knew somebody in Lansing and they got the job done. This is a great old vintage picture drawing of the library. Fast forward to the 20th century though, and this beautiful building had its limitations. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, our building didn't pass. Various leaders of the LAA had brought up the possibility and the necessity of making this grand old building barrier free. Even our own members had difficulty with the entrance steps and the interior stairway to the auditorium. Here's another woman of vision, Lois Richmond. I believe she joined the association in 2002 and she became president in 2012. And she led the association through the process of really doing something about accessibility. Yes, the ladies' library needed a lift, an elevator. So the 21st century campaign began. It was the project to raise money to construct an addition on the back of the building, um, maintaining its historical facade and exterior but the, build, the addition would be built on the back. It would provide an elevator and barrier-free bathrooms. This was completed in 2013, and Lois Richmond's presidency ended. Her energy did not. She's a woman of remarkable energy. She moved on to a new project, telling the story of our gargoyle. The building, had a 12th century British or English gargoyle outside on the downspout. In the 1960s, it was stolen. We had no idea who stole it. It remained a mystery, and it remained missing for about a year. Suddenly, it appeared again on the stoop in kind of a wooden crate in pieces. There was a note. The note said, I did not take this, but I got it, and I've returned it to where it belongs. So the gargoyle was repaired by uh, Corwin Reif, longtime curator at the first Kalamazoo Public Museum, and a man named Lou Wallace in Portage a metal worker fashioned a duplicate. So the duplicate is now placed once again on the outside of the building. It's uh, on your left. And the 12th century one from the English cathedral is now mounted inside on the wall and it guards the books. So Lois took this story thought about it, and decided to fictionalize a, an account of how it went missing and how it got back to the ladies' library. She called her book The Missing Gargoyle of the Ladies' Library. She worked with an illustrator from the KIA uh, by the name of Denise Lasicki, and she self-published this book with Season Press. That experience gave her the confidence to tackle yet another project. 
As she looked around her in the library, and as many of us do, she thought, what a treasure this library built or this building is, what, what rich details it has. The woodwork, the exterior brick, limestone trim, stained glass windows, vintage photos that are archived but seldom seen by any of the members or the public. She realized that there needed to be a way to share all of it. The idea of a pictorial guide came to her. In the fall of 2014, she chose a team of other LLA members to come aboard the project. Women who had a special interest in some aspect of the library, women who had some writing and editing experience, women who had served on various committees and knew the history and the workings of the uh, association, one woman who was a photographer. Our photographer, Carla Noemig, took over a thousand photos of all of the details of the woodwork, every painting, every sculpture, every statue, every stained glass window, and chose finally over 200 photos for this book. Lois and Carla together devised a rough outline and an assignment chart to keep us organized. Uh, the photographer designed a similar kind of thing with columns, uh, the content of each chapter, what we needed to go have pictures of, what we wanted to write about. Lois thought about how long each chapter should be and how big the picture should be, you know, if we wanted a big spread for a certain painting or a big spread for the stained glass windows, that sort of thing. So then the research phase began. <clears throat> Luckily, all of the old ledger minutes of the association from 1852 have been kept and they are archived. So we had lots of historical sources to go to. There were vintage photos. There were materials in KPL at uh, K College's library on Lu Lucinda Stone and her husband. Uh, there were historical newspapers that were now digitized and you could go to the old Kalamazoo Daily Telegraph, it was called, before it was the Kalamazoo Gazette. Because, you know, these associations, these clubs, uh, printed their minutes on page four, the social page of these old newspapers. Helen Sheridan of the KIA was a member of the Ladies' Library Association, and she did a previous description of the art and the windows. So that was available. There had been an earlier book that was a terrific source for us. This was done by Grace Potts and Cheryl Lyons Janess, but it's very text heavy and only a few photos in the back. And what we decided we want was a pictorial guide that shared all those rich details of the windows and the woodwork. We took trips to see those archives up at the Zhang Legacy Collection Center on WMU's campus. Sharon Carlson there uh, was our consultant. I apologize, I don't know her title. Judy? Yeah, she's the archivist there. She's in charge, I think. Anyway, so we had uh, several months to do our research. We had sort of a timeline to follow. It got altered as needed, but the writing began. And of course, what we were gonna do was not gonna leave something as beautiful as this handwriting from one of the old uh, archived minutes ledger. But we chose to, uh, you know, of course, do this with our computers and our word processors uh, we chose to author collaboratively. Uh, our writing level for seven different women 
was remarkably even. Two people, Judy was one of them, were named co-editors, so they were the ones who smoothed out the duplications, smoothed out the omissions, smoothed out the egos. One author's significant other um, is quite computer savvy and had done lots of scientific writing. And he encouraged us to use some collaborative writing software called Mercurio or Tortoise, we called it because we love this lovely little icon. Uh, he loaded it on all of our computers. We typed it home and then choosing the correct menu and tab or button, we pushed it to some level or platform of this software package where the editors could look at it, we could see what each other was writing, and so forth. And um, in theory, it was great, but this was not without its problems because we had different kinds of computers. Some computers were newer than others. Some computers could handle that software better than others. Each of us had a different comfort level with uh, the software and using it. But we persevered. And as a former teacher of English and having taught hundreds of kids to teach research papers, I am so thankful for Microsoft Word software program because it has improved to be such a complete package that we had very little work to do when it comes to footnoting, uh, bibliography, index. You enter your information one time and the software just makes it appear where you want it to be, whether it's an index in your text or a, a footnote inside your text or on your bibliography. So um, I've been retired from teaching English for 20 some years and uh, it's just remarkable how big and inclusive that Microsoft Word uh, package is. Uh, Lois chose Season Press to be our book designer it was the same company that had worked with her Missing Gargoyle book. So Sonia Hollins was our consultant editor, editor and she helped us with things like the copyright, uh, the ISBN. They had done this many times before with people who wanted to self-publish. She helped us work with Amazon, where we uh, chose to have it self-published because we could do small quantities on demand. And her husband, Sean Hollins, was really the creative force behind the layout and the design of the pages. And we think he has done a remarkable job. We're just so proud of him. Each chapter began with a quote and a two-page spread that faded into the full color on the right-hand side. He was very thoughtful about the placement of the text and how it matched the space he had to work with. He was thoughtful about where the small photos that embellished the larger thing uh, were placed on the page. And the result of a year and a half of work by a devoted team was the final publication and the launch of our beautiful book, The Library Ladies of Kalamazoo, Their Home and History. 18 chapters, it's indexed, there's a timeline, over 200 photos. We're selling it. It's available here tonight or at the ladies' library or it's available at Michigan News Agency downtown. The book is like a guided tour, welcoming you into the foyer, asking you to step through the tall wooden doors into a wonderful Victorian world, a very special place. I'd like to end with a poem that one of our members, 
Lynn Patterson wrote, Ladies Library, three friends, a reading circle, then eight, boned and laced, restricted, they do what they can. A lending library, first women's organization in the state, one place they can vote. By 1879, the building. Music, lectures, and programs, Horace Greeley, a phonograph concert, women who wanted art, and books, and health for Kalamazoo. Their motto, do what you can. So they did. A day nursery, school health programs, literacy. Today, their sisters tend the legacy, husband the building, stained glass, gargoyle, the books. They learn, they give, they celebrate, they honor the women who stretched and reached and still do what they can.